Hello and welcome. We are here with Christopher Roloffs, who is uh, one of the main artists for our MOOC at UFM, Discovered Don Quixote. Uh, he's in particular responsible for the drawings that are used in our discussion forums, our online discussion forums. Uh, he's a very interesting uh, man. He also has a, a lot of other interests in life, and we are going to discuss uh, several of them. And we also are interested in his impressions of UFM. So welcome, Chris. Welcome to the University Thank you very much. of Francisco Marroquin. Uh, you are uh, a man of many traits. You do many things. I'd say so. Yeah. Uh, you're an artist. You're a designer. You're, uh, a const you're in construction, building, um, painting, sculptor. Um, you also uh, obviously do drawings for our MOOC, our online course on Don Quixote. You have also been a businessman. Yes. Um, you've run restaurants. You've owned companies that uh, make bars and furniture for restaurants. Yes. Uh, am I missing anything? You're also very much uh, interested in cars. Yep. You're, you're a mechanic, yep. a builder. So um, let's talk. Let's start by talking about your art in particular. Okay. Uh, mainly painting, although other things. More illustration, uh, okay. pen, pen and ink. Uh, although I, I paint, I do okay. paint. So the painting would be secondary. Is that because you began? Very young, as a, is that the easiest way to start to draw? Yes, yeah. It's, um, I find myself just with my free time. Some people read, and I will pick up a pencil and just start drawing. So okay. it's very easy to just illustrate something in black and white. Okay, you mentioned free time, freedom. What right. does your art? <laughs> what does your art have to do with freedom? How 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 is being an artist uh, related to liberty? Well, I guess there's a certain uh, individuality that comes with being an artist. Um, it's self-expression. Um, and uh, just uh, taking that and taking that time and, and being yourself and uh, expressing yourself uh, all through your life, not just in isolated situations. It's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. It's a mindset. Okay, so being an artist has translated into how, how you are and who you are when you interact right. with other people. Right. Have you ever had anyone attempt to uh, censor or repress your art? When I was young, I guess uh, censor or repress would, I think, fall into the lines of like public schools and medication. You know, so yeah, early on they thought maybe a little medication would settle me down and get me more into the academics, but. So they looked at your art and said, this is a sign of something wrong. Yeah, yeah. Or they thought it was a symptom. I, but, but, of, of that, that, uh, my attention span was not of that where the academics uh, were, were what, my focus. Okay. I was often so, over here drawing something while the teacher was Teaching. Very interesting. Yeah. So engaging in art was seen as a uh, rebellious activity. You're sure. not you're not towing the line. You're not participating. Paying attention. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. So um, and what tell us a little bit about your art. What what's your specialty? What uh, themes or ideas attract you? Well, I I think I I really feel as an artist you have to master everything. Um, so I love to paint, I love to draw, uh, sculpture, uh, designing, building furniture, um, just pretty much anything I, uh, somebody throws in front of me, I feel like I can do. Mm -hmm. My focus is more, I have a studio in Virginia, and my focus is more on just drawing and painting though, there, because okay. the facility is set up for that. Okay. Do you want to, would you talk to us a little bit about your work on uh, Don Quixote and Cervantes, this MOOC? How, how sure. is that, has that changed your impression of art or has it just been a, an excuse to uh, further express your artistic vision? How, how has that experience uh, The biggest impact on me is you? the quantity of uh, pictures in the time frame. And even though we've worked on it for two and a half years, um, it, it's, it's been a challenge to get through one, move on to the next, get through that one, move on to the next. You know, now we're at 50 plus drawings okay. over the period we've done. And so it's, it's so pushed the, you? Yeah, definitely okay. pushed me. 
how, what's your impression of Don Quixote as a, a work of art, or Cervantes as an author? You're, you're illustrating these uh, scenes, these episodes, and we consult. We, right. we go back and right. forth. But what's your, how, how has the experience changed your impression? Did, did your having to draw and illustrate Don Quixote um, break with your expectations? Was it what you thought it would be? Um, having, I never read the book in, in the past, so having gone through the book with you, mm -hmm. um, I saw it in, it, like, my vision of it was the stereotypical, there's Sancho, the little, little short guy, and, and, and crazy Coyote just running around attacking windmills, and, and so after going through the book, I, I realized there's a lot, there's a lot of humor, a lot of irony, um, uh, it can be lighthearted, it can be very dark, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I've, I've grown to appreciate just uh, the depth at which uh, Cervantes went, um, or how deep down the rabbit hole he went in writing mm -hmm. the, no the novel. And do you think Don Quixote has lessons about freedom and liberty? Uh, yeah, I think so, constantly. I mean, uh, this guy's running all over the planet, you know, just doing his thing. Okay. I guess so you, there's a lot of freedom there, right? Do you see Don Quixote there's, as an artist? In the sense that, you know, he just follows his passion. Okay. Right? Okay. So he's following some sort of inner inspiration right, yeah. that's his. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about your construction and design uh, and building experience. Because okay. I know that's a place where you, uh, in a more tangible and literal and contemporary sense, you come up against people who I guess we would describe as people who want to limit freedom, not to say enemies of freedom, yeah, but people yeah. who at least are trying to repress the creative spirit in some way, much like your teachers in grade school. These right. are now uh, modern regulatory people with badges and Bureaucracy. official yeah. status. How, how, how has that experience gone? Where did you first notice that kind of uh, response to your well, creativity in terms of building and construction? I, I guess it started with being an artist, people would ask me, can you, can you design me something? Mm -hmm. um, and then they realized that I could build it also. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I got a reputation for being able to design and build anything, mm -hmm. um, I started getting a backlog of people who wanted stuff is, to the point where I would have to tell somebody, it's going to be a year before I can start your project, wow. if you'll wait. You know? and, and people were willing to wait. What happened was I wasn't able to um, legally do the projects. So in order to, uh, I, I found out that even if I, somebody hired me to build a bar, mm -hmm. you know, which I was thinking of as it's kind of like furniture, but technically I needed a building permit for that. Okay. And then there's degrees of building permits. Uh, you really? Know, yeah, you can, you, you can 7,500 per client per year is, is a class C, 120,000 per year is a class B, unlimited wow. is class A, and you have to have $50,000 in cash in the bank that you can show the government if you want the, the, the A class. If you want the right to build stuff. Right. You have to come yeah. up with cash. Yeah. And, and you have to fill out, I assume, a whole slew of forms. And even if it's less than 100, even if it's 120 or less, and it's a new structure, mm -hmm. that falls into A class. So if somebody wanted a $30,000 addition on their house, right. even though I had the class B license that was for 120, it's a new project. So that falls into the A class. Oh and so before you know it, I mean, you've got to get your licensing mm -hmm. worked out. Then you have to have your business license, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have to pull in your, uh, your uh, labor and anybody who works for you more than 20 days is considered a W-2 tax form uh, full-time employee, which costs 40% okay. more. Okay. Um, and so I ran under the radar for years. Okay, so your first response to all of these regulators and bureaucrats was to ignore them. Yes. Pretend like they didn't exist. Yeah, because the goal was to get the projects done, right. not to appease the bureaucracy. I believe you had a formula that you expressed earlier. You, it's easier to 
Um, to do it and, and ask forgiveness, is that what you, <laughs> then permission. Okay, so yeah. it's easier to do it, make do the project, and then right. later deal with the consequences right. than it is to seek permission to do the project. You'll never do the project if you're seeking right. permission. Right, right, exactly. They'll just shut you down. Right, and then, and then depending on who you're dealing with, you might have to offer some donuts or a piece of pie. <laughs> so it's easier to be nice and Right, be nice sweet. and, yeah, okay. just say I'm sorry. So you're, I, as I understand it, you're no longer in your, you're no longer your own businessman in Virginia. You now work for Habitat for Humanity. Yes. And that has added a wrinkle to your perspective on this regulatory leviathan that's coming at us from the state? Toward or? the end with my design build company, we became so big that we had to become legitimate. You, it was impossible to be secretive or, or fly under the radar. As you yeah, mean. and we started getting big enough projects that we would lose money if, if we j just didn't get to the next step as a builder. Okay. So the last five years of the company were above board uh, license contract. Um, we didn't do the, uh, the W-2 paperwork, uh, but we made it the, the workers' responsibilities to claim their own taxes. Okay. Um, and, but it was pretty much above board toward the end, and it was uh, a considerable burden. So it was a significant amount yeah. of work and time and effort. Yes, yes. As opposed to focusing on your art, your creativity, right. your construction. And, and so now, yeah, I am with Habitat, um, and, which is even really a bigger scale than what I was dealing with. And, and we have to be not just kind of legitimate, but completely across the board legitimate because we have a reputation that is uh, kind of a leader in the community. So... Want, doing your own thing, wanting to do your own thing, imagining doing your own thing is repressed in the United States, in Virginia. Absolutely. The, the land of one of the states most associated with the early revolutionary movement, people like Jefferson, and it's, uh, it's happening, Madison. Yeah, it's happening um, in ways that a lot of people in America don't even realize. For example, if you own a large piece of property and you have a stream that goes through that, through there, mm -hmm. the EPA has claimed uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah, the Environmental Protection Agency has claimed jurisdiction on all waterways. They were trying to get puddles. Right. They didn't get that this time. Right. They'll eventually get They'll the puddles, right? right? But so they've got a program now where they go to the farmer and they say, "You have to fence in your entire streamway, and we'll pay for the fence, mm -hmm. and then we'll make a little trough that water goes in for your cattle." But then you you don't own that stream, and anybody who purchases the property will never own that stream for forever. So, so you're not allowed to use that resource anymore. So they have a, a seductive strategy. It's it's not simply a top-down tyrannical imposition. Always, it's a subtle process. They will yeah, seduce yeah. you into being right, regulated. Exactly. Wow. No no more uh, ponds unless you have a permit. So who are the heroes in, in this story? Who, who do you see as resisting? Are they simply small-time builders and artists? Are there lawyers out there? Are there people you know who are pushing back? I think it's the, there's, there's the group that, that's not willing to give up. You know, almost that kind of uh, pirate attitude where I'm gonna, I want my stream to be mine. I want, my, I want to build what I want to build. Okay. Um, and and it, it happens in, in I guess different groups. You got one group that wants to build it, mm -hmm. another group that wants to fight for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess those would be the libertarian lawyers, right? Okay. And uh, the community that's willing to support it. Okay. Um, how many people can you convince? Because some people can be programmed pretty easy. They're like, well, I kind of see why we all should give mm -hmm. more taxes so that okay. the children can have nicer jungle gyms. And you're like, okay. you know. Is there a way that you relate your art to those experiences? Is there a way for somebody who's appreciating the, the lifelong work of Chris Roloff's to perceive that uh, libertarian perspective that you have? I, I mean, I guess so. At this point, I, in my own way, have found how to do whatever I want. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live on a big property where nobody can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So um, I get to do all my mad scientist, mm -hmm. you know, building, playing stuff, 
Right now, the kid I'm building a kid's an 18 foot teepee, right. um, which probably would need a permit if somebody. It's an impermeable structure somehow. Right. right? It's yeah. causing runoff. Yeah, exactly. Somebody will find a way to call that a roof or a structure. Some, that yeah, needs if a they knew. Tax I'd... and a permit. All right. right. Wow. And you want to talk briefly about your car that you're going to produce and is going to be mass consumed, and the government's not going to regulate that, right? Well, <laughs> depends on which government, right? Right. We know uh, the United States isn't going to put up with that. There's right. not enough money backing it. But anyway, it's a it's a car. Uh, it's a modular design, aluminum frame. It's uh, designed to be made out of car parts, and um, the real. I guess just of the whole thing is it was designed to take just about any motorcycle. Mm -hmm. It's universal. Mm -hmm. um, and bolt the pieces on and you got a car that kind of resembles like a 1940s style sports car. Like the old uh, soft top Jaguars or the, the MGTC or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds very exciting. It sounds like something uh, Don Quixote would be driving. At this point, I could see that. Yeah, here. yeah, a little bit dangerous. Uh -huh. It also, it also sounds, Chris. It sounds like the government's going to need an entire department for you. I've, I've, I've got angles that they're going to have to <laughs> deal with. I'm, you know, I was thinking like you start with your motorcycle and you, you cut the, the serial number out of the frame and you weld it to the car and then you use that title and get a motorcycle license on the back of it and. They're going to have to kind of figure out even what's going on. All of a sudden, they'll be driving around. The guy can present his registration. So, and so thank you for sharing your experiences <laughs> as an artist, as someone who is uh, attempting civil disobedience in a massively growing regulatory state. On a daily basis. On a daily yeah. basis. Uh, we really enjoyed having you at the University of Francisco Marroquin. We hope you it's had a good time. It's been an honor to be here. Terrific. And with that, we will conclude this interview. Concluded. Awesome.